Welcome to this episode where we are talking about attachment styles. And, you know, in this whole series, we're talking about self-awareness. And I have to say, when I first heard of attachment styles and started really looking into it, this helped me become self-aware probably more than anything else. And so I want to get both of your feedback on attachment styles, but mainly, Jim, we're going to lean into you for this episode. Mm -hmm. So take it away. Well, I would start with, you know, we've done self-disclosure appropriately on this program before. And so my attachment style is an anxious from childhood, an ancient, anxious attachment style, and I guess ancient too. And um, the idea of going around constantly looking, am I safe? Do you approve of me? Do you like me? And that ran the show in my life for, for many, many years. So that's just a true confession of my own style. People will ask, not trying to get too far ahead of it, do you think attachment styles can change? The best research I've read would be maybe a 30% chance or 30% of people can. And I've said this way, I don't know if attachment styles really can change. I guess they can, but I know that I can change and I will and I have. The number one thing I've found in the attachment research If you want your attachment style, unless it's a secure attachment, if you want it to change, is do lots of self-awareness and a lot of therapy usually to work through that. And you move from, as I have, from an anxious attachment style that can still rear its ugly head to more of a secure attachment style in functionality. People will know, by the way, Dr. John Bowlby, uh, who was really the father and founder of the attachment field, And he looked at, you know, think about a baby in utero is attached to an umbilical cord, life, and how safe they feel. Then they come out of the womb, and it's like, where am I? So we're all a little bit born into trauma, right? And separation after being with mama, separation from mama. He uh, was this British psychoanalyst, and he talked about really really, uh, studying infants. And he found out that these caregiver roles, whether it's the parents or caregivers, daycare is a big issue in our time these days, he found that infants would basically go to extreme measures to try to reconnect to mom. If mom was in the room or out of the room or any other um, caregiver to reestablish contact, he said it this way, I'm quoting Dr. Bowlby, the propensity to make strong emotional bonds to particular individuals is a basic component of human nature. I don't care now, I'm 61, I still want to connect I definitely want to be attached, let alone getting to the Word of God, that the two become one flesh. So there's that. Think of bonding when you look at that. Um, Back in the 70s, this is the next big name in the field, psychologist Dr. Mary Ainsworth, people that study attachment know the name well. She took Bowlby's research and then expanded it in what she called her strange situation study. She looked at kids between the ages of these formative early years, between 12 months and 18 months and just looked at how they simply, these kids, responded to situations where they again were left alone for just a moment and then they were reunited as as they needed to be with their mothers especially. Mm -hmm. Now think about the etiology or the origin of attachment styles. From her work she came up with three major attachment styles. Secure attachment, this is where the child displays uh, distress when separated from the mother but then is easily soothed and return back to that emotional self-regulation, that that steady state very quickly when reunited with mom. Nothing wrong with being away from mom, little separation anxiety, and then the securely attached child would quickly get realigned. Dr. Ainsworth then said the second classification would be the resistant attachment style where the child displays intense distress when mom leaves the room, and then when mom comes back, resists contact with, with mom with with this idea of being reunited. Third one would be the avoidant style. The child displays no distress at all. This is the one that's going to scare or concern most of us, the avoidant attachment style. Mom leaves, fine. Mom comes back. No real interest in mom's return. My goodness, if this could start this far back in early being an infant or a young child or toddler or pre-toddler, and then imagine when you're 40, and you have an avoidant attachment style, which is clinically where we'd see some narcissism, right? That's a really scary thought. And one more is to to kind of just to summarize this in more of the popular culture now with four different attachment styles, and then ask yourself, where do you fit with these? 
One is the secure attachment. That's considered, again, the healthiest of all the attachment styles. So imagine you're secure in and of yourself. I'm mindful of Blaise Pascal who said all of our problems as people stem from the inability to sit alone with yourself quietly in a room. Are you good to be with yourself without swiping, you know, or looking at Netflix and just dissociating all the time? Secure attachment, that's what would be the healthiest. Number two, the avoidant attachment. Again, narcissism, sociopathy, uh, sociopathy being a sociopath. We see a person, it seems they have no empathy for other people. That's the kind of insecure attachment where back in the day, the infant or child doesn't feel safe to explore any of their environment, so they're not going to bond back with the parent. Mm. That's scary to be, again, young and then be at 40. Mm. These people are going to have real difficult time staying in or being in and connecting authentically in a loving, secure relationship. Number three, two more. Anxious attachment style, you're going to see what I call low self-esteem, codependency, neediness. That is the one I've had in my life that's had a lot of healing of that, but I'm going around there and I'm looking constantly for somebody to take care of me or tell me that it's safe. It's almost I'm desperate for that, especially when under distress. And then the disorganized attachment style, some people talk about borderline personality disorder can be there. That's in the original style where an infant experienced a lack of emotional responsiveness from their caregivers. Hey, no one's there to take care of me. So instead of showing either avoidant or anxious behaviors, they just show this inconsistent or disorganized behavior or attachment. Much more could be said on that, but those are the categories that we see mainly. Well, I've read about three of the attachment styles. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of the resistant and I haven't heard of the disorganized mm -hmm. before. It makes total sense. Yeah. Um, but when I sat down to look at the the three that I was looking at, it was the avoidant, the insecure, or anxious, and the it's secure. secure. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I was having a hard time, mm -hmm. and here's why. Because in certain seasons of my life, I felt like the description of secure was pretty applicable to me. Mm -hmm. But then in other seasons of my life, I felt like I was more anxious. Mm -hmm. And so, Very common. And then now I feel like I toggle between sometimes anxious attachment style and sometimes secure attachment style. And so, I mean, I don't want you to totally out me here no, on I'm this not episode, gonna you. but I do want to know, like, what what's the deal? A person can have an anxious attachment style and be with a certain friend or two and feel like, look like they have and studies have been done on this, a secure attachment style. They could be in a job or a situation where they're just killing it. They got everything going on, they get in a room, and somehow because the nature of the job or they have the authority or power, they look very secure. Or they can have good boundaries and be, hey, this is business, we gotta get to work, and look like you've got the avoidant attachment style. Here's the question I throw back to you, always throw back to myself. If there was, not just in seasons, chapters, or certain venues, or arenas you're in, ask yourself, do you feel of the, let's just do the three attachment styles. Do you feel there is one that if you were weak, I get weak some days, certain times if my bandwidth is thin, is there one of the attachment styles that you would tend to quote, go back to, because the research would show that's usually what's going to happen. Is there one that stands out? Mine's gonna be anxious, I know me. Yeah, I would say in times of distress or weakness, I definitely get anxious. So mm -hmm. does that mean that I really am the anxious attachment style? I don't go to, Joel, help me here, you know the word, ontology. That's a theological word that that's my being. My being, that's my, my odd. Yeah, it's not who I really am. Real. It is what was wired in me back there. We got nature and nurture with children, right? Was it something you were born with? Did it happen because of the early caregiving years? Here's a freebie I tell people. A double dog dare you, go back, you've seen the trauma egg I mm -hmm. do in my intensives. Go back if your parents are still alive and say, what was going on while I was in utero? Was right. I wanted, was I not wanted? Well, I wanted a girl and you were a boy, I've heard it all. Was mom under distress? Was there good night fetal alcohol syndrome? Was there anything else going on? The, your parents, were they in a hard place in a marriage? Because that bonding in utero, let alone right after you were born, nope, mom was mad and something else went on. Parents can often, if you want to know, give you data like, yeah, the actual bonding thing there may have been there. I go back to get nature and nurture that 
I don't know to prove, was I really born with this attachment style, same way I do with the Enneagram stuff I do. But I would say, as you look back, best you can remember, same for me, same for Joel, in early life, do you feel like looking back with your adult mindset, you would have gravitated early in life to one of the three, there are four, but let's say the three attachment mm -hmm. styles. Mine's clearly anxious. Do you think yours was anxious early on? I think early on for me, um, my dad was absent, mm -hmm. and but my mom was so incredibly present. Yeah. And, you know, she she wanted, I think, a best friend immediately. Mm -hmm. And so she was very quick. I mean, she potty trained me. And I know you're not going to believe this when I say it, but I have pictures to prove it. She potty trained me at eight months old. I can believe because you already told me the story. And totally that right. that's not because, <laughs> like, wow, I was really crawl going at eight ahead. Months old? Uh, no, she has a picture of me sitting on the table on a little pink potty. <laughs> and I could, like, I was floppy. And yet somehow <laughs> Eight months is young. she still did this. So anyways, I had a very secure attachment mm -hmm. with my mom. Mm -hmm. um, but and they were getting noticed and not with dad. And not with dad. So it's just, it, to me, it's all information. Say, let's get this mic microscopically down. I know it was this or that. I think it's just all information. I'm not going to let attachment style and attachment theory define me. I'm not going to let my Enneagram number define me. I'm going to say, huh. That's information. I tend to probably lean yeah. this way. I, think I that's really good. like what you just said. Yeah, just don't quit defining me in that stuff. The, like, the eh. theory part is really important, the theoretical aspect. Okay, so I'm going to confess. When we were getting ready to do this episode, I started to research because that's of course what you I did. do. That's you know? right. So I, uh, the, the attachment styles, I'm going to say a couple things here because I know for me, when I was first looking through this, I was like, this feels overwhelming. Secure attachment, anxious, ambivalent attachment style, avoided, and then uh, disorganized attachment style. So I found what I maybe is a helpful summary of each of these, Please. but I want to go and, and pass it by you, Jim, you know? So anxious ambivalent style could potentially be summarized as a poor view of self and an overinflated view of others, mm -hmm. right? Okay. An Very characteristic. And an avoidant uh, attachment style, an overinflated view of self, but a poor view of others. Mm -hmm. And or I would say, I would add just anecdotally or an almost a non-existent view of See, others. that's good. Relational objectification, you are just an object. Exactly. Me, and then the disorganized attachment styles, which from my research said is really a combination of anxious and avoidant together, mm -hmm. right. is both a poor view of self and others. Mm-hmm. Like that's... A plus plus. And then so secure attachment in an ideal world and I'm making this definition of myself and I'm going to need you to clean it up, is really seems to be an ordered view of self. And mm -hmm. others. And others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an that's ordered really view of good. Self and I, I like defining it that way and breaking it down that yeah. way because that's really helpful. At, at first, when you said the disorganized um, attachment style, it made me anxious. <laughs> so I was well, like, See, notice, notice there for a moment. Can we pick? Can we have fun? <laughs> Always. Lisa knows. She knows me so well. Think about the language. Our words... Frame, frame our reality. reality. You, Jim made a statement and it made me anxious. Remember to take back your dignity there, even on a podcast. It did not make you anxious. Okay, this mm -hmm. is good. When Jim. this happened, I felt I anguish. Felt I mean, picky words. No, it's very important because I don't want to give my power. It made me. It's like, boy, how do I have the power to make you feel that? That's such a good and You already know phrase. all this. It's like reminding. It's but it's, it's just because yeah. I hadn't heard of that one. But when you yeah. just described it, and as you talked about it too, mm -hmm. it makes so much sense. Yep. So and I think I think it's so again I'm gonna go nerdy with you for a I second. Like I know you guys love it when this okay, happens. We love Joel's but nerdy. I know. So uh, and again, Jim, this is your field, so it's like you know I'm interviewing the expert in the in the field. There were two pretty significant research papers or studies that were done. One I want to say I'm top of my head, so this is dangerous. The Dartmouth study and the, the John Hopkins study, which actually showed and proved that attachment is hardwired into the human mm -hmm. genetic makeup of humanity. Is that a fair? I think that is true because we all started out attached, sperm, egg. I mean, if you want to, how far back do you want to go? Yeah. I mean, there's a, it's, things are literally attaching, attaching all the way to the umbilical cord, still probably the safest place you've ever been at yep. one level, getting all that nurturing. And then we come into a world, the first thing you did, I cut three umbilical cords at Baylor Hospital downtown Dallas with my kids. Three. And there is there was a severing of the attachment right away. 
I, I like the studies that are out there, but to get totally empirical and come back and go, I know for a fact that it was hardwired, I just can't make the leap or won't. I say, probably, mm -hmm. but all I know is, and of course I'm way down the other end of saying, let's work to see functionally, it's happened to me, your attachment style change. I have watched mine, I don't even, my wife and I say, we don't even recognize our younger selves when we were first married. Mine was the most insecure, chaotic guy you've ever met. Now it comes out certain times, but it's not the main operating system for me as insecurity or an anxious attachment style. So I think this is fascinating because I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do some theologizing with the both of you, my friends here. Um, I find it fascinating that in the creative narrative that when God creates, he's creating groups of things mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. It's the stars as groups. It's um, the ocean and the land. It's, it's grouped bodies of water. It is land animals and sea animals, grouped bodies of water. And then, interestingly, when he creates man, man's alone. Mm -hmm. And at every stage, like good, 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 not good. Mm -hmm. What is not good? The individuality of man. And so I'm just going to like read from like one of the most famous texts. I feel like this is like the one that we go to all the time in uh, therapy and theology. But uh, it says, so the Lord caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. And God took one of his ribs. So talking about attachment and detachment here. Mm -hmm. So God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then, so he takes out something. Then the Lord got out of this thing that he took out. He made for the man, um, he, he had taken from the man into a woman and then brought her to the man. Now we've talked about this. I've talked about this in nauseam about the rib. The rib in Hebrew there, it's actually not just uh, the word for rib. It's actually shalah, which means the side mm -hmm. of something, a pillar of foundation and structure. So even from an imagery standpoint, yeah. I mean, this is fascinating. It is. That in order for the man to have in human relationships, we're going to talk about God later, but in human relationships, in order to be whole in the ideal of Eden, he actually has to become halved <laughs> so that the opposite whole could come into existence. Wow. And then the only way for the two halves to actually truly become whole is for them to be attached back together. So then the text says in Genesis 2, 24 through 25, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds. We can highlight, so circle that word. detachment prescribed mm. right. to detach so that you can, can attach. attach. Okay, yeah. and they become system. one flesh. There you go. Okay, so the one flesh thing in ancient Near Eastern language in Hebrew, it is very significant. It's one flesh, one bone. I mean, this this idea of, of union together, okay? Yeah. But the bond word is incredibly interesting. In Hebrew, it's debak. It means, uh, it deals with a type of connection or attachment that is intimate or generally friendly. And the other time this word sh it shows up a lot of times, but we don't have enough time to even unpack all this. I wish we did. But Ruth, Orpa, and, Na and Naomi in Ruth 114, when they're getting ready to separate, here's detachment, attachment. Again, they wept this, the, the two daughter-in-laws. They weep loudly. And Orpa kissed her mother-in-law and she detaches from the family. But Ruth debak, Ruth clung to Naomi and stays with her. She, she stays attached uh, mm -hmm. in that familial bond. And so we really see this profoundly in scripture as well. I'm so glad you brought this part up yeah. because, and I know we only have a few minutes left, but I want to know how do the attachment styles affect relationships? Like, <laughs> are there certain attachment styles that really don't attach? Are there certain styles that attach better than others. And so I've got a great curiosity around this. Sure, so it would seem quite logical and it is quite true that two people with uh, a secure attachment is probably gonna have the best chance to be able to have a healthy attachment, bonding and oneness. I've said, again, it's almost a trivial throwaway line. Uh, you know, until you get really better, not perfect, but better to be alone with yourself, like yourself, be good to have good emotional self-regulation, self-awareness, and you're not just, oh, desperate to connect, um, you're probably not ready to re-enter or enter a more uh, relationship like a marriage or dating. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean perfection. So if you get uh, two people who are in that, that healthy, secure bonding, okay, what can be terrible, I believe personally it's going to be hard with anyone with an avoidant attachment style for anybody to bond. How do you bond with that? And we tend to bond deeply with our same level of health. But if you get someone who is a 
anxious attachment style to try to, and there's, do you love me? Do you care for me? With an avoidant person, it almost looks like a sociopath or a narcissist. That's going to be a real problem. I think it could be like the problem with possibly two anxious attachment styles coming together. It's a tick on a dog mentality. A tick gets on a dog and sucks the life out of them. The problem with two anxious attachment people is you have two ticks and no dog. Mm. I mean, this is, I need the life and I need you to tell me I'm okay. It's Jerry Maguire, the movie. You know, you complete me. No, no you don't. Not fundamentally. Mm-hmm. So I think some of this, and then looking at some of the, if I may, the, the psychopathology of it, like someone with an avoidant person, a lot of narcissists there, and they just don't do empathy. And if you're wanting even in a healthy way some empathy, doesn't mean, and the research would back this up, it doesn't mean you can't bond with people like that with different attachment styles. I care only a little bit of your attachment style, how you were born. How do you want to work on that, be in that 30% club in the research that attachment styles can change? And hey, I don't know for sure if they change, but I change. And I grow, and then John 17, that Jesus' only real prayer that you may be one, and we become in oneness together with the power of the Holy Spirit. With that, I think that will potentially trump and override all attachment styles. Of yeah, and that's an important one, Jim. And I would just add, this is where I think often what we found is that therapy and theology run as a train on tracks together, typically. Yes, right. there, are, there are principles that are leading together. And yet, there are certain times when there are psychological or therapeutic principles that might be driven from a perspective that is um, detached from the reality of the gospel and the resurrection mm-hmm. of Jesus yeah. conquering sin and death. And so while there might be some theorists out there that might be like, oh man, you can never change your attachment style. Well, I would say, yeah, but nobody ever thought that somebody could conquer sin and death through death itself. Mm-hmm. And yet the tomb is empty. Mm-hmm. Jesus is alive, reigning and sitting at the right hand of the Father. So in that sense, when we become a new creation, yeah we are actually exchanging fallen and broken ways of attachment to be reconnected to the one who is trustworthy and faithful. And so mm-hmm. in light of the gospel, it's a totally different scenario for those of us that put our faith and our trust in Jesus. I love that. And of course, the purpose of this series is not to say, ooh, you're in that kind of relationship, good luck. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. the, the purpose of the series is really to increase our own self-awareness That's because right. when we are more aware, of our tendencies. And that's how I kind of like to look at any of these kinds of things and mm-hmm. attachment styles. Like I have a tendency toward this, there you go. but with good work, I can possibly move more toward secure. Mm-hmm. And I remember just as an example of this, um, Jim, we've worked together for so long and you have seen me through so many mm-hmm. hard days. Um, and, you know, when I experienced the death of my marriage, which is something that was probably one of the greatest traumas. It may have been the greatest trauma Mm -hmm. of my life because it was stretched out so long and and it's not the outcome that I wanted. And so I remember I experienced the death of my marriage and I'm on this healing journey. I'm seeing you quite often. And I remember one time I was in a season of pretty intense loneliness. And you said to me, Lisa, I think you need to learn to sit in like the loneliness or sit in the silence and learn to be okay with yourself. You didn't like that. I did not like that at all. (laughs) About the third time that's happened with us, but yeah. I was like, (laughs) that's what I paid for you to tell me today. (laughs) Like, But I remember going home and thought, okay, if the sign of emotional health is that I can sit alone in a room with myself, I'm going to prove how healthy I am. I couldn't do it. I could not do it. Mm. I would try. I would sit there for a few minutes, and I would be like, this is the worst. And I had said, it was almost like, okay, well, I'm just going to pick up social media for a second. Or, okay, I'll do that after I go watch this show. Or, you know, I've got to turn on some music. i got to call a friend. And none of those things are inherently bad. That's right. But the awareness that you created in me is I needed to learn to be okay with myself. And it really served me well. Mm because I spent two years saying, I will never, ever, ever have a future relationship. Like there's just no way. And I think during those two years of me saying no, not ever, what was really happening is I was healing to the point that I was freed up to not need someone else to help me get better. 
but I got better so that I was, I was completely freed up to want the right kind of person and the right kind of relationship. And with attachment, if I may, at the risk of not at all trying to be clever here, I believe what happened there, if I may just use the nomenclature, is you went back into what could have felt like a tomb. It wasn't. It was not a tomb. It was a womb. And you were not like Nicodemus in John 3 or the idea of salvation, but you went back into a womb, start attaching with yourself, and I know you too well to attach with God and other good friends. And out of that, you were born anew there in to go into the next season of your life. And that's a sense of many wombs, I believe. We call them tombs, and it's like, no, it's a womb to come back and say, I need to be reborn here in this way and find out I can be, develop a secure attachment with myself and the next program coming up, not just with myself, but with God. That's so good. And so whether you're in a situation that is like mine, or mm -hmm. maybe it's completely different, I think us having this kind of information, maybe you're in a marriage that's struggling, well, why not use this information to mm -hmm. be able to determine, hey, this is something we need to work on together. And it's more of a discovery than a detriment. Yes. And so when you're able to discover, it's like, when we start to realize that we need to heal and we actually start to deal with the issues at hand, then that's where real progress can be made. So no matter what situation you're in, maybe you are having a hardship with your parent or your child or a spouse or a friend or you know whatever season it is that you're in, use this information to help you become more self-aware. Because again, when we know better, we do better.